Hello and welcome to the recording is on. Oh, okay, we're recording now. Hello and welcome to the first, um, hopefully, weekly meeting for the Sustainable Urban Design Project. We're open source on GitHub. My name is Bradley Christopher Oxley. Um, the project uh, sort of, you could call me a project manager or something like that. I'm working on organizing the backlog and issues and overall the overall idea. Uh, and, Design, hopefully uh, building a community on the project I'm here with, with. Hi, my name is John Inman, and I am interested in uh, contributing some um, statistical analysis, uh, data science um, support to the project, as well as learning some of the uh, Django backend infrastructure. Cool beans. So I'll just, we'll dive straight in. We're going to kind of follow a quasi scrum um, format. We're going to say what we've been doing, uh, any potential blockers, which is actually one of the more important things to discuss, to be honest. Uh, and then what we'd like to do individually um, going forward. And while the product backlog, you know, has a bunch of ideas, uh, really the work should be self-inspired. This is uh, the idea of this project. It should be you know, using your, the powers of intellect and the skills you've acquired along the way, but in a heart-driven manner, something that truly is um, out of your own emergence. So, John, I'll just send you the link here to the backlog. Cool. I don't think we'll be able to um, screen share, or actually I might be able to screen share in Jitsi Meet as well. I don't know if that'll disrupt the uh, recording. It shouldn't. Chromium tab. Unfortunately, if, um, Jitsi keeps having troubles with Firefox support. So, John, and I yeah, <laughs> I'll get there. All right, so I'm sharing the issues link if you want to open it in your own browser. I don't know if that's a little easier for you to see. I did open it in Firefox, and fortunately, Firefox does support GitHub, so or yeah, vice versa. Yeah. Generally, the the World Wide Web is pretty much the purview of Firefox. <laughs> <clears throat> this WebRTC is just a new sort of newish standard in terms of browser support, at least. And believe it or not, Firefox, as much as they've um, kind of pushed the envelope and su supporting the emergence of web standards, they, they were lagging on some crucial features for making WebRC more efficient for multi-user chats. And that was one oh, of the see. long-standing issues. Oh man, bad timing on that with the <laughs> pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, WebRTC, hey, Zoom actually uses WebRTC underneath it. So um, I think WebRTC has got some good, um, it's proven itself, <laughs> so to speak. Oh, yeah. Okay, so basically, where we've been, uh, John, do you just want to, before we get into the, much of the backlog review, do you just want to describe what you've done uh, in the past week? It doesn't have to be necessarily a backlog item, just whatever relevant. To the you know, topic. sure. I have a, a little item up. I'm going through a book called Django for Beginners, and my commitment is one chapter a week. And so far, I have uh, gone through the first two chapters. I have not checked the second box yet, but I just. Okay, I did it for you. Thank you. All right. Are you going to put a, a nice avatar on GitHub? Yeah, I've been meaning to. I have this idea for a picture. Um, it This yeah. requires getting up at sunrise, which I haven't managed to do yet. So uh, All right. it's maybe I'll fill in something in the meantime. Yeah, I think Zoom has virtual backdrops nowadays. <laughs> if you just want to cheat. Oh, yeah. I'm just kidding. All right. Same thing. Yeah. So that's good. And the reason uh, you're studying um, Django essentially is that is the web framework. This is a web uh, oriented project. Most of the heavy lifting is going to be happening on a server side and the client will be JavaScript with um, some data visualization and mapping. So it's very light um, client and heavy server. And uh, another reason for, I guess for John and for you exploring the Django side of things is that it's gonna be the most um, close to any sort of data science and statistical features. You're gonna be doing them more than likely on the server um, in Python, or if we figure out a, an easy way 
to integrate other code. Um, certainly you could check out integrating our code or other languages, but hopefully we'll not to have too much, uh, too many languages to manage. Okay, so then in the past week, what I've been doing is I was taking, I'll uh, mention a course on the edX platform on sustainable urban development. Um, it's called, uh, part of a certificate program, urban, sustainable urban design of sustainable urban de development. It's a couple of years old, but uh, the course is still available. And I just enrolled in the certificate program just so I could, um, oops, I disabled screen sharing, uh, just so I could, um, oh, you'd save 10% on <laughs> buying the courses. If you pay for the certificates, then you get to do the quizzes and they're verified quizzes and things like that. But it's a pretty cool course. Uh, in general, it's really relevant to what we're doing here. Hmm. So I actually was able to finish the course in a week and I'll tell you my secret and, and I, you know, maybe this is cheating a little bit, but, um, and also if anything, I'm cheating myself. Um, I started, you know, watching all the videos and, um, in watching these videos, I had like, you know, a whole lot of inspiration for this project. So I, I just had a flurry of activity on the backlog, but after a while I was just wanting to kind of get through the paces. And, uh, I started by actually each week has a, um, quiz. So I started by just opening the quiz in a new tab and reading through them. And a lot of the questions I could already kind of answer, hmm. either they were worded in a way that was just easy to answer, or I kind of had an intuition or previous experience. And the questions that weren't so obvious, I would go through each of the previous videos and they have a transcript and you could do a search control F and search yeah, the transcript yeah. and yeah. kind of, you know, cherry pick the answers. No, they're not all just literally you can control F and find the answer type of thing. Some of them you have to really put uh, a whole, you know, bunch of things together and go out a little bit. What's that called? Uh, not on a limb, but, you know, where you you synthesize some knowledge to, uh, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, but in any case, that was I was able to finish the course in a week as opposed to eight weeks. And you can see the edX courses are um, they're Creative Commons licensed, so. Um, in a way, they're open educational resources. And the edX platform is also built in Django, interestingly enough. I think. Ah. So if you're finding interest in open educational development, uh, this might be a good project to get involved with. Huh. So okay. that's what as a contributor. Like, as a contributor, yeah, and a good way to learn how to, um, you know, well, yes, yeah, con contribute to an open source project because there's more to just contributing than writing code, yeah, I suppose. I don't yeah. think you're, you're necessarily implying that, but no, it's one of the things we've kind of been emphasizing with this sustainable urban design project is uh, you don't have to be a coder to get involved. We need a lot of help. And particularly at this point, we're in a research oriented phase. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, did you have any struggles this week, John? Uh, with this project? No, it's, um, yeah. Still. In general, like relating to development or personal development, like, a, you know, technologically speaking, something that you could share, like, obviously. Well, sure. Um, project. So I just actually got a new computer and uh, mm -hmm. that always takes a little bit of time to, to set up because I have a pretty complicated workflow. I work with Microsoft Windows products uh, oh, for yeah. work. Um, so fortunately, it's nice to be back on Linux uh, where they have VirtualBox and I can install Windows and sort of. I don't have to dual boot. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah. Um, well, no Linux obstruction. With. Sorry, what strategy? Well, Linux distro. Oh, yeah. I went with Arch Linux. Uh, I knew it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For BSD, you got to go to Arch. You can't Ubuntu or anything like that. No, I guess I find Ubuntu a little too uh, um, easy, I guess. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so... Right, arch cool. was um oh, and did I, you just do straight arch or have you checked out that um manjaro yeah what do you think uh no i haven't checked that out i my understanding of course and i could be wrong is that my manjaro is just really a, a sort of a, a, a gooey in, arch. a gooey installer i mean oh, well okay. maybe maybe there's some yeah no i don't i haven't looked at it so maybe there's some some tools on top of it uh <laughs> i don't know um i was thinking yeah. about 
Arch the other day and my colleague Conrad at work, he uses Arch. Uh, and he uses the I3 window management system or something like that. I don't even know. But uh, Yeah, yeah, that's what I temporarily <laughs> installed I3 because that's what I used to use. But um, fortunately, because of GitHub, I have my dot files uh, stored on the you know cloud and so i downloaded my dwm config and just i'm running that now John, um, i've been using linux for like over 10 years now and i don't even know what you're talking about <laughs> dwm it's uh it's like the grandfather of tiling window managers okay uh, yeah it's all keyboard driven basically is, is yeah. the idea behind it um that was just basically a geeky compliment <laughs> <laughs> well yeah thank you you're the one who uh opened that Linux door for me those many years ago. Oh, and cool. I've, I've spent many, many quality hours of procrastination um, tinkering with my setup. So. Yeah, and troubleshooting wireless drivers. Yeah, and apparently now dragging other people through that pain with me. So it's <laughs> a lot of fun. Or graphics drivers, I guess. What's worse, wireless or graphics drivers? Um, you know, I, I do have this new computer does have a discrete NVIDIA card. And uh, to my surprise, I haven't really had much trouble with that. I just installed the NVIDIA driver. Um, which is another big difference between uh, Linux and OpenBSD. And here I am. Yeah, that's been my experience too lately, especially in the last five or more. Even back when we were at Woolman, it was getting a lot better. Just the draft, graphics and uh, printers, uh, you know, wireless, I guess, hasn't really been an issue. It just stopped, started working out of the box. It stopped being that's such right. a pain. Yeah, it seems like Linux is getting a lot of support um, these days. I was surprised when I... Uh, reinstalled and uh, could immediately down uh, download and install a native uh, Linux client for Microsoft Teams, which I again oh, oh, yeah. use. I'm I have to use that for work, yeah. but uh, it works natively in Linux, which is wonderful. Yeah, and this is a, a shout out for the web platform because Microsoft Teams also just mm. runs in the browser. Which no, is, it does. Yeah, um, with limited I, I, uh, experience, I'm slightly sure. more. I think I can't uh, share my screen, which sometimes I need yeah. to do. So yeah. that's why I was, I was especially happy that I didn't have to figure out how to try Did to try in Chromium. <laughs> oh, um, that's, no, still I... the, that's the perennial issue as well. Browser compatibility. When you open up a Teams link, uh, yeah. Microsoft tries to nudge you towards using XPG Edge, open. of course. Oh yeah, of course. Um, but even Edge does not have uh, screen sharing support. It, it last I tried. Ah, okay, okay. So cool. Having a native client is great. All right, so that's great. To aside in the open source, our open source bumpy road journey, and I guess yeah, the other I was thinking about it too. The wireless issue has been um, smoothed over because when you're installing um, Linux, you often have to dry, download drivers and packages, so they, you know, networking has taken a high priority. That smooth path, but graphics drivers and graphics drivers seems to be important too because you have to uh, you have to see, sort of so to speak, what's on the screen in order to click the buttons. Accessibility yeah. has been another issue that's been improving. Um, this weekend, I think, was maybe one of the first times I I, I was I also because I got a new computer, I gave my old computer to my wife and I mm -hmm. set up her with a new OS. Ubuntu, uh, Debian, and um, I just. I just happen to have, and plus, it's nice only having to update every two years. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I guess so, but then you have, you don't have features for four years that you would. Otherwise, you don't. I don't think no. that the oh man, we're going to go so deep on this, but I don't think that the whole security stability ethos of Debian is actually in the favor of the user. In fact, some of the features and and releases that come out of these projects are in making them more stable and secure, and to have a feature freeze for years is, I think, a mistake. Yeah, no, to, uh, to full disclosure, I uh, Linux, amazingly, has a firmware updater. If you're from UEFI, mm -hmm. uh, U -E -F -I. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, sadly, the Debian um, firmware updater was so out of date that I couldn't even run it, even though I have a uh, an error that comes up when I boot because there's a firmware bug. So, so yes, the, uh, Riley, you're absolutely right. I actually went to sleep thinking that, you know, darn it, I, you know, successfully installed this uh, <laughs> from Wi-Fi, which is quite a feat. Yeah. Um, and I think I might actually just install. Do it. Go with Ubuntu. Yeah, an Ubuntu Plain. variant. Oh, an Ubuntu like variant. A, yeah. 
Yeah, like Katie. Zubuntu. Oh, um, right, right, because you need the light weight. Well, this uh, is for my wife, actually. So, um, Ubuntu it GNOME. Ubuntu GNOME. Just try she, it. Okay, I'll, I'll try it. She um, has been using uh, XFCE for the past couple of years. Is, ah. and, and I'm concerned that GNOME is kind of, uh, well, they have a, they've kind of gone in a different direction, haven't they? And they need a, you know, it's a bit of a learning curve now. With the name. I'm, I'm not sure to be honest. Um, oh, okay. I've been using KDE. I, I don't know much about it, but I just think um, following the simple defaults might be a good good thing uh, for easy user experience because uh, well, it's just a critical path, I, so to speak. There's, go ahead. Now that I think about it, um, there's many Ubuntu variants, but I can't think of one specifically for GNOME. It seems Ubuntu, like default, Ubuntu itself. Doesn't it come with uh, Unity? No. They oh, okay. passed, uh, two years ago or so, something recently, uh, in any case, switched to GNOME. Yep. Okay. So, and that's going to give you this that a critical path, or there's a, probably a different way of saying it. It's the, where the most uh, attention is being focused because it's the highest trafficked area. Uh, and just the default Ubuntu install is just going to have a lot of polish and a lot of focus and fixes and things. So, yeah. Um, okay. Whereas X, the Ubuntu and the Lubuntu. Uh, they have a smaller community. Kubuntu. I'm using Kubuntu, and I've had and great how, experience it, with it yeah, for okay. over two for four years now, okay. and working both at work and home. Okay. So if you like that type of experience, um, I highly recommend it. I don't know in terms of resource resource usage, because I know the Zubuntu and Lubuntu are more optimized for I don't, efficiency. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not terribly limited by hardware, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They just the only thing about the GNOME and the uh, KDE is they need some 3D acceleration, whether it's on board, you know, on the motherboard or otherwise. No, that's, um, that's completely to, fine to composite things. But okay, yeah, and I don't, I don't know anything about the hardware so that you're running. So I just was, if you, you know, since you're talking about the. Lubuntu and Zubuntu, I thought, might have had resource constraints in mind. Maybe in the past, and that's what yeah. kind of, that's what she's used to, and yeah. she's not terribly enthusiastic about changes for the sake of changes. Sure, sure. Um, but this is change for the sake of her experience, improving her user yeah, experience. And it's and a, you might actually you might actually be right about that. So I, I think I might uh, take that advice, and <laughs> I might just install just uh, default Ubuntu, actually. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've tried it a couple of times and it's great. It's really smooth and well polished. Um, yeah. And I guess it was a good move for them to switch back, back to GNOME. So we have less fragmentation, a little less fragmentation at least. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. All right, let's get back on this sustainable urban development thing. We can have more asides later. I just want to keep this video kind of short for uploading purposes. And yeah. uh, but this is really fascinating. So if you can kind of start to see if anyone is actually watching this, the kind of tangents uh, that John and I yeah. get off on, uh, get onto. <laughs> In, uh, in general, and some interesting topics. So, and it came up because you had some struggles with, uh, slight struggles with just switching and choosing uh, your, your development environment. And yeah. my main struggle has been whether or not I should have, have blazed through this course so fast if I'm missing mm. some cool stuff in the videos because yeah. the evidence by the book, Backlog and specifically this epic, this epic I opened up because of an assignment on the course. Um, epic number sixty. It's not only epic; it's number sixty-six. If you want to open it up, and I'll just describe it because I think this is more or less the epic we're currently going to be focusing on. Okay. And an epic, um, just in our our usage, I suppose, would be some work that's going to go on for a while. We don't necessarily have a deadline or anything like that, but it'll be, we'll be making multiple issues from this. This is a parent issue of uh, potentially dozens of issues, depending on um, how we break things down. And okay. uh, again, I'm not only taking the course, but I ordered this book called Sustainable Nation. And I think that's mm. actually the textbook for this project. I'll just show you real quick. That's the textbook for this project. Okay, cool.
Okay, so I'll just start my video real quick. I'll disable the screen share. But um, yeah, I don't know what what your book budget is or your reading availability is. I know you're already working through the um, the Django book, so don't feel obligated in any way. When I, I mentioned see. these books in my, okay. can you hear me? Oh yeah. Okay, cool. So this first book I, I grabbed uh, a while back. It's not so super big. It's called Resilient Cities. Mm -hmm. And actually, this book was cool. And I, the reason I got it when I was browsing the books online is because mm -hmm. Elvin has played in this fountain. Oh, wow. Cool. And another thing is when Sophia and I um, uh, were kind of still together and she was visiting my dad, um, we had a, and <laughs> this is a little bit private uh, sort of a thing, but it's kind of interesting to share this serendipity that we were talking about earlier. Um, we had to catch a train in downtown Denver. That's where this Union Station, that's where this fountain is. It, and at that point, the Union Station was under renovation. So they actually, was before this fountain existed, and uh, we were hustling because we were running late for our um, train. We were going to miss it. And we got you know, off the bus or whatever, and um, we had our, our baggage. I don't remember. I think we were going to California at that point because we were going to like, Alice and Owen's wedding, I think. And in any case, um, we get all the way to Union Station and we're like out of breath and it's like closed for renovations. And for whatever reason, like the Amtrak website didn't tell us or we didn't pick up on that fact. Um, but these construction guys like gave us a ride to the temporary Amtrak station, um, which was instead of being at this Union Station, which is so nice. Now, if you have a chance, if you're in Denver, just to go inside there, there's like restaurants and bookstores and this oh, fountain wow. where kids can run around. It's just really good and so one of the featured cities in here is some of the things that the city of denver is doing uh huh. to be resilient and also throughout this book is the city of perth uh -huh. and i found in hindsight that the um co-author peter newman is professor of sustainability at Curtin university which is in perth and i didn't know that when i bought the book hmm. but okay huh. so that's <laughs> pretty cool huh yeah all right. So yeah, if you just want to light re read, it's, you know, quick to get through type of thing. Okay. Good one. Overcoming fossil fuel dependence. That was my thing. Cause at that point in mm -hmm. my career, I was shifting, you know, uh, this is now public knowledge. I was, we had just taken on significant funding from BP at mm -hmm. my day job. And I was like, Whoa, uh, we're supposed to be a sustainable company. What does this mean? You know? And I started to see fossil fuels as like the elephant in the room. This is, you know, through so many voices coming to us from the young activists and the scientists that fossil fuels, you know, are, and our consumptive patterns around um, that those have fueled um, are devastating our planet. So I picked that book up. And plus, you know, because the reason we're doing this is for our kids, right? So just seeing Elvin playing in that fountain made it concrete for me. Hmm. Here's one I haven't started reading, but I got, I got in the same shipment, Sustainable Urban Environments. Hmm. Actually, I have started reading. I'm halfway through it. Oh, I forgot about that. Okay, well, I'll finish that one soon. Cool. It's an ecosystem approach, which is something coming out of our background at Woolman, where we started uh -huh. uh, focusing on you know, like systems thinking and things like that, and environmental justice and social justice and things like that. It's all inter interwoven. And the book that I believe is most relevant to this project, I was searching for um, urban design patterns, sustainable urban design patterns, to see if there was already a design pattern library before we started building uh, the feature that's our first feature in this project. Now, this is called Sustainable Nation. Uh huh. And um, Douglas Farr, it's a Wiley book, it's hardcover. So it's a textbook. Oh. I think this is, if anything, the textbook for this course. And uh, it has a number of um, case studies and patterns that are being applied, and in specific, and another serendipitous thing. Um, it has a case city study of Melbourne, Victoria, Australia, that I used to demonstrate um, a potential realization for our project. Let me share the screen again now. So I'll just start at the topic of this top of this epic and start to think aloud. Interrupt me at any time if I'm going too much, but. I just want to really frame this because this is the closest I've come to having like a, a complete vision of the project. Our okay. motto or goal is to have like a, 
um, be an urban designer's, an urban planner's best friend. And mm -hmm. what does that mean? What do urban planners need to do? How can we support that work? Hmm. So the current uh, course I well, actually just finished that urban as part of the four course certificate program. Uh, they have this tool called QuaKit, which is an open source urban design application. We develop um, visual methods for analysis, design, and simulation of urban systems for a sustainable future. And some of the metrics you can read about on the QuaKit web page, um, and I think they have links to the accompanying research. Let me see if I might have footnoted those. Uh, our visibility, like how far you can see from a given point, what, what's your view, what do you call it, view shed? Centrality, how many places, uh, sorry, how many routes from place to place pass through a given place? You know, like you can think of a, a Union Station or what's a place in um, slow that's really central to a lot of routes? Is there such a place? Um, uh, in terms of a view? No, there... accessibility, like um, central squares, you know, all roads lead to Rome type of thing. Yeah, I feel like the mission might um mm. do that in so the mission would have a, a high centrality and there are mm -hmm. statistical and algorithmic approaches to measuring these and mm -hmm. centrality specifically involves graph theory mm -hmm. so the reason mm -hmm. i'm constellating all these and putting them out mm -hmm. there so you can see what resonates with you and be like whoa that's my domain let me check that one out density and distribution so like i think mainly talking about population density accessibility not only in terms of <clears throat> able-bodied people and how um people are able to get to a place but also i think we should put a slant on um accessible design in terms of you know equality and um differently abled people um projects come to mind like the um in portland oregon there's this sidewalk i can't remember uh sidewalks project where there's they're just looking at sidewalk cuts curb cuts to see how a wheelchair accessible they are and you know scooters uh how navigable they are for people uh, who rely on wheeled um, mobility. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, connectivity, I'm not sure, but that's graph theoretic. Personal preference, this is more um, qualitative, but how people you know, feel in their environments. An example comes out of, um, I don't know specifically where I've encountered this, but you know, the importance of green spaces that people uh, don't just walk from um, monolithic concrete um, uh, courtyard to courtyard, you know, that we have like um, places where we can be, feel secluded and safe, harbored and quiet, you know, quietude, even in urban yeah. environments. Uh, walkability, mm. uh, kind of self explanatory, but in terms of um, statistically, mm. it means there are key services and amenities within a reasonably convenient distance round trip, like. Five, uh, five or ten minute walk to and from a grocery store. Yeah. You know, so you don't have to um, drive or, you know, lug your groceries too far. Economic feasibility is another lens that they use um, just to say how much will this cost if we do this urban re renovation. Um, and for some reason, they, they have differentiated walkability, accessibility and walkability, quality and feasibility, economic feasibility. So there's a little bit of redundancy. I haven't quite dug into that. Uh, hmm. Okay, so outdoor thermal comfort, you know, how much, uh, again, probably green space there is, how reflective the services are, or energy absorbent, or um, probably even talking about green roofs, you know, those types of things would be in that branch. All right, then the sustainable nation chapter I'm on currently uh, have a series of case studies where they have these sort of like information dashboards almost hmm. that are data driven. And we could, I've created dashboards like this in products. Um, yes. I'm currently involved on, in fact. Um, and so they have a whole list of these metrics. And what we could even do is just break this list down by metric and say, how do we compute that? What type of data do we need? And what type of display would we have? Uh, kilowatts of photo photovoltaic energy that they're generated and or consumed in a given catchment. And I think that would largely be mm -hmm. controlled by the geographic extent of the view or selection in the view. This hmm. should be an investigative tool an analytical framework providing these metrics based on the queries of the end user and not just some presupposition of like what we think people are going to ask um, mm. number of biking 
bike parking spaces, amount of car share space, uh, average car sharing spaces per residential unit or square meter or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So you, you, we want to normalize these as well. So you can compare um, not just the raw count, not just the raw number, but um, some sort of a, you can compare city to city or region to region. Green rooftop space, percentage of affordable housing units, how do we quantify affordable? Um, 100 year storm events or, you know, how uh, are the levees um, protected? What are the what are the storm events in a given area? Finland is pretty mild. I don't know what our climactic uh, threats are. Uh, California, there's some pretty clear ones. Uh, wildfires, coastal flooding, drought, which is tied in with wildfire, uh, hurricanes in other areas. What is the tallest building height measured in feet or meters? Uh, as well as stories, but the book Sustainable Nation says that stories can be misleading. You can have a five story building that's 500 or that's a thousand feet tall or whatever that because it has a spire uh, or some kind of geometric, no, yeah, or, uh, architectural. Uh, yeah, in any case, so generally to feet or meters because it affects view shed and also would, we would need to render that as you recall from last week's session, we were going to start rendering these in, in a low level. Uh, low quality, low level of detail, three-dimensional um, renderings. Acres of green space. I'm sorry, I'm taking too long. Uh, dwelling units per acre. That's one of our key metrics is how densely populated the area, the uh, urban area is, how many people can afford to live there. Hours of sunshine per day, which is really challenging in the Nordic areas because we, we go from like almost like five hours of sunshine a day to like 23 hours of sunshine a day. So that's kind of interesting how it'll change seasonally. Uh, development awards received if there's some kind of um, any buildings that have received a LEED certification or some kind of other sustainable award. Heating degrees, how often, you know, how many days of the year people need to use a heater or cooler, uh, rainfall and other climactic conditions, um, mixed use zoning, which is increasingly important. And that's not the American way but it certainly is here in Europe, very prevalent. And then I have one um, additional spin-off feature that I think there was something in here I thought it was just, um, you would totally be interested in. Maybe it's not this one, but um, we'll need to visualize um, the urban yeah. metabolism. So how um, energy and resources and people, you know, and manufactured goods flow into, around and out of uh, an urban environment or a catchment. Uh, so it's a global issue. I mean, there's not really any way, way you can uh, delineate that um, cleanly aside from our planet, unless you included like astronomic events, like mineral deposits from asteroids, but that would be pretty far-fetched um, for our scope. But uh, there are there's some really interesting stuff and tools for um, interactive simulation of complex systems and designing them with intuitive interfaces. So yeah, if you're interested, check that out. And then I'll just quickly um, <clears throat> refer you to re just read through the issues I've put in our backlog so far, particularly these design and research issues. But this issue number 69 might be something that's interesting to you and coming out of your direct experiences, water resource modeling. All right, so that's a really quick overview of kind of a large, uh, like a sweeping change in our backlog, but it's the first time we've had a chance to touch base on it. In the future, we'll be able to focus more on particular issues. So does any of that stand out as interesting to you, John, or what are your thoughts? Are you there? Can you hear me? Testing one, two. <laughs> I'm not sure. John, did I lose you? Okay, because your connection is a little bit oh, jerky. All right, I'll stop the screen share. You can see I'm sweating. I'm so excited about this. 
Can you hear me, Bradley? I can hear you now, and you're not as jerky. I think we might be having some bandwidth issues. Okay, yeah, I just refreshed the browser. No, that sounds great. It sounds like a lot of those ideas came from the urban planning um, book, which should hopefully ensure that uh, this has direct relevance to uh, actual urban planners. Yeah, thanks. We don't want to, you know, reinvent the wheel. We don't want to sort of be couch chair, like just totally guessing. We want to actually rely on existing research. And once we get an initial, you know, 0 0.1 prototype, we'll actually start contacting people to test it out and give us direct feedback so that, you know, every step of the way we're getting user feedback and we're um, adapting the project to meet that feedback. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm looking at this uh, list. Yes. Um, I, I guess one question I had was uh, with regard to the view shed is the basic mm -hmm. unit of analysis. Um, I'm not familiar with working with view sheds. It seems like they can and often overlap. Um, so I don't know how that affects. Yeah, view shed goes from a single point and it's what is visible from that point. Right. So there wouldn't be any overlap. It's just, you imagine like um, lines converging outward or inwardly from an observer and what obstructions yeah. prevent the observer from seeing off into the distance, including haze and things like that. Mm, but, okay. So, and there's, there's existing tools for this. So, if you want to get a better sense of it, it might be a good opportunity for you to dig in and get a little research and just come back with um, how you understand a view shed and if you think it's feasible for us to attempt to do anything with it at this point. Gotcha. We don't have um, a clear um, roadmap right now, so I'm sorry for that. But this is no, just no, a whole brain dump of yeah, it's awesome. this stuff. Um, so yeah, you mentioned watershed analysis. It's something I might be particularly uh, qualified to address. And, and I, I guess actually I put to... a lot of details in that issue to jump off. There's some really cool tools available for that. Let's and see. we can in integrate them into Django relatively easy. That's Water why yeah. you'll basically have to have a functional understanding of Django so that it's not getting in your way when you're trying to do actual apl applied usage of these tools um, yeah okay but if you want to just sorry but if you just want to um experiment a tool commit that code to github that's perfectly good too i can work on an integration of django but eventually we do need to get it somehow into the user interface which means coming through django our server app okay um yeah a couple of things i could think of there would be sort of a a point and click function where you you click on a point and it sort of uh, on the fly delineates the watershed you're in. Very uh, cool. Yeah, depending on scale, right? Because it's, it's sort of mm, yeah, like if the uh, Mississippi Delta is huge. Right. If you wanted that scale, Where's which I think in the catchment, it's half the North the, American continent. Exactly. In the watershed world, that might be called a huck. Oh, uh, cool. Eight. A huck eight or something, um, hydrological uh, unit. unit. Yeah, and Conundrum. like you said, you could be somewhere in Louisiana. You could click it, and if you're working in huck eight, you you circle half the continent. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, uh, having that at various scales. I think another uh, very useful tool would be again sort of point to an area of potential development and yeah. have have that sort of do a network path to the nearest receiving water body. Okay, go ahead and write these down in some way that's convenient because as it comes out of your head, catch that idea in the most convenient fashion. Um, both of these are sounding like very useful features, so there shouldn't be any impediment for you to record that uh, idea and link it to this issue or even just put in a comment of this issue and we'll break it out. And I think those All are right. both very feasible maybe not exactly what the issue as it's described, but that's the point is you can take ownership of that. In fact, the yeah. first issue on the task is research various tools and methods for hydrological analysis. So it sounds like you've already said, well, you need various huck level analysis given, given a point you need nearest water yeah. body. Yeah. So those are the, right. the idea of on the fly watershed delineation. Um, yeah, and there's with, tools. We... Yeah, one of the parameters being what what huck level you're looking at. 
All right, cool. Yeah, so, um, yeah, just, do you want to take this issue? Would that be a good yeah. one for you? All right, I'll sign you to it. Cool. And however you take it forward, I'll just throw a couple more recommendations in there. You know, um, check the resources in the that I've added, if some of them have those capabilities, including quantum GIS, because um, a lot of what we can do already exists in QGIS. It's just yeah. the interface is not our end goal. But right, right. all that code being open source is actually compatible with our project. Yeah. So I would probably start working in QGIS yep. more. All right, sweet. And then uh, just so you know what I'm going to be working on, I think at this point it would be good for me to finalize this user interface prototype and merge it in with our main project. Uh, because when you d were describing the Huck analysis, <clears throat> you know, clicking a point on a map and seeing a um, uh, catchment watershed, um, we have to have the basic interface in place for that. And I need to be able to even wire up click events to get the geographic coordinates given a user's input and the mode of analysis they're in. So clearly in your case, they would be in some sort of watershed analysis mode. Um, I don't know, water resources, watershed analysis. And then they would see relevant tools like a Huck analysis tool or however you realize to convey that and keeping in mind simplicity and usability and Huck almost might be too jargony, but if it's a familiar, um, concept to or, uh, hydrological engineers who would be a key uh, you know, user group, then we can use those types of uh, concepts, of course. But some way to gra graph, you know, iconify it as well yeah. for people who might not be steeped in the knowledge. Yeah. Sweet. I think that's about it for our stand-up. So we went a little bit long today. We had some cool tangents, uh, <laughs> an epic to uncover. So essentially, I'll be working on this add 3D city map canvas to app UI. I'm already assigned. Oh, cool. And uh, issue number 62, I will finish it up probably tomorrow because I already have the prototype. Hmm. Oh, and we're agreeing to use that e-charts, right? Yeah, I know. That looked really cool. Yeah, it's super powerful. It's holistic. It, it comes with batteries included, including this 3D WebGL uh, geodata display and an analysis and visual, you know, like visualization color raster. Uh, you can visualize raster data or vector data. It's crazy powerful. It, it was crazy how it went from charts to 3D buildings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So we'll work on that. And then we'll need those charts, of course, for, you know, like uh, certain displays. Like if we want to look at um, what was it, the analysis of, uh, daylight over seasonal daylight variations or things like that well that would be a line chart you know stuff like so yeah just right. to have it not have to hodgepodge um, a javascript library i'll focus mostly on the javascript parts of the app because hmm. i think you're going to be more comfortable in python and data science land, yeah so try to learn one thing at a time i suppose well yeah that's the that's right that's the perennial yeah issue Hmm. Not to spread ourselves too thin, but I'm still I'm doing like studying music and things like that. So yeah, I don't know if that they'll fit uh, both pursuits, but I think it's a valuable. But yeah, I'm not gonna be like this. Um, what's his name? Robert uh, Glasser, or what's his name? Um, I wish I could remember his name. Yeah. I was close. I was really uh, close. He has been, he's just a prolific pianist, an amazing uh, pianist, very inspiring. And uh, he's in this neo soul genre. Uh, perhaps we should take this off of line, but uh, I just want to say that he has this idea. One of his song titles was like, This is all I do, essentially, basically saying he just plays piano and it shows. I don't know if I can be that kind of person. I'm too excited about going in multiple directions. Maybe not everybody needs to be a maven more of a visionary i kind of see ideas constellated and i need help to draw the to connect the dots <laughs> and i'll roll up my sleeves too though but yeah jacob collier robert glasper alicia keys um have been really 
Adele have been really kind of inspiring my like pursuit of music recently. That whole the vein of neo neo soul music and the just the talent of those, those artists. Right. Yeah. How's the Go playing? Should we should we wrap up this meeting and talk of Go and talk of some other fun stuff? Do you want to do a pair programming today? Do you have time? What's your schedule? Uh, yeah, I typically block off about three hours for these meetings, so I I should have time. Um, yeah. All right, let's just wrap the meeting up, and I'll I'll publish okay. it to YouTube in a minute. But yeah, so this has been a little bit um, uh, a little off the cuff, a little bit disorganized of a, a meeting, but hopefully it gives a sense if anyone's watching or anybody's interested in reading a transcript of the thought process behind the project. Mm -hmm. uh, I also actually should mention this for full disclosure, John, um, because it's pretty important. In fact, when we're talking about sustainability, sorry, it's going to take just a couple more minutes but uh, I was meaning to bring this up earlier. I completely left it off the agenda. Um, I'm in, uh, I was just accepted to a, an entrepreneur training program in Tampere. Uh, nice. Finland has a really great startup culture. I think part of it is because of Nokia's um, sort of failure. As you know, Nokia is hmm. a city just west of Tampere and it was like the um, birthplace of the Nokia company maybe. Uh, who mainly manufactured like tires and boots, but then got a technology sector making cell phones and it was acquired by Microsoft and it was kind of devastating. It devastated the Finnish economy when that happened. So all of a sudden, all these people were suddenly unemployed and this, as a result, I think, best I can figure, uh, there's this really great startup culture because all these entrepreneurs needed to find new work and had their own inspirations and innovations they wanted to bring to life. So yeah, I'm part of this, a little bit of an incubator and seeking um, not only help, but financial assistance to incorporate a startup for this financial sustainability, the fiscal sustainability of this project. And that means I have a goal of hiring and, and it's a, I, at this point, I'd like to start a co-op. Um, although I've been advised that maybe just an LLC is wiser. Hmm. Um, but I want to keep you in the loop because I see you as a co-founder. Cool. And, if there's any ability for us to start paying salaries, I'd like that you could receive some bounty as well. Um, but my um, hopeful goal right now is just to get, to be able to focus on this project full time and not have to do it evenings and weekends. So whatever that takes to bootstrap the business and not take on a bunch of venture capital funding and things like that, if oh, even wow. that's a uh, possibility, but yeah. Oh, wow. um, Sorry, this, just to keep going on about this, but just what's going on in my work uh, yeah. has just, and the previous company I worked for uh, have just been awakening to me that venture capital funding in that Silicon Valley Yellowbrook Road is not a sustainable way mm -hmm. to run a company. Yeah. Do you want this video to be published? Yep. Okay. <laughs> this is fine because um, I'm not really disclosing really anything specific. No, that yeah. So, I'm just thinking, you know, people have experienced companies probably uh, being venture capital funding, and you don't even have to think of the companies I'm working for. You, for well, I'm example. thinking more in terms of just uh, voicing your sort of uh, goal of working on this full time. Oh no, that's perfectly fine too. Um, yeah. You know, firstly, I don't think anybody from my company is going to see this video, but even then, you know, it's common for. Uh, people in our the technology industry to have ideas and want to do our own startups and stuff. So, yeah. yeah. But thank you for actually pointing that out, John, because that, yeah, could have been a uh, detrimental mistake, but yeah, there's many factors and this we can go into offline off, uh, off the call. But yeah, I, the important thing is that we're transparent about the financial plans as well as the technological roadmap for this project. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Mm -hmm. So thanks. For hanging out, I'll go ahead and stop the recording now. Uh, if you're anybody's interested in more um, information or getting involved with the project, stop by GitHub. We're really trying to put in the foundations right now to make uh, our project very community oriented and welcoming to contributors of all backgrounds and mm. uh, interests. Mm. Cool. Thanks, Brad. All right. Thanks. Uh,